and we are live. Uh, let me grab my phone because um, I've received a few different complaints. Once, first, that my voice was too quiet, and then someone said it was uh, ear rape levels of loud. So I'm going to check on the YouTube live stream, and if it is too loud, I'll just adjust the gain on my end. Um, so let's see here. Um, nope. I've received a no, no, no. It's perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so today we're going. Go ahead. It reads red for both of us when we are talking, but I think with my filters on, it's bringing them down. So I think we're okay. Okay. Well, today we are reading. Uh, we are reading the Parasitic Mind by Gadsad. Now, the Parasitic Mind um, is a is a uh, book that Gadsad wrote. Um, Alex, would you mind while I take a picture of this book cover and make it into the cover of this stream, which I should have done earlier, but forgive me, would you mind saying a little bit about who Gadsad is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Gadsad is a uh, Canadian uh, professor. And he studies specifically parasitic ideas, the um, ideas that are damaging and spread within the human consciousness. Uh, he is incredibly sarcastic, uh, incredibly intelligent. His uh, reading and study is very wide. Um, if you're not following him on Twitter, you probably should, uh, because he's also really fun um, in his intelligence. Uh, and that's why I was so excited to read this book. <laughs> All right, hello, Bridger E, and hello, Publius Virgilius Morrow. It is very nice to see you both. Um, and hello to all four of our concurrent viewers that we have within the first two minutes. That's an unusually fast ramp up. Please remember to click the like button. Uh, before we go any further, and I will begin discussing the book in just a second, but I did want to remind you all to um, follow me uh, on Substack. If you look in the description, there's a link. Uh, there is a link to calebbeers.substack.com, um, and that is my blog. I publish there every day. You can sign up with your email address, and if you do, you will get... A, an email every day with something new that I've published. Now, I do have written over 2,000 answers on Quora.com, and I curate the very best of those answers on that blog, but I also do write some original stuff on there. So you get a good uh, cross-section of both um, things that are new that I've written, but you also get, part of the, as part of the cross-section of my writing, you also get uh, a lot of the older stuff that I've written, some of the legacy writing that was really good, and I'm now selecting only the best stuff from Quora. Uh, so with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, dive in here. It would be really nice if this thing would actually let me take a screenshot so I could actually put this onto the YouTube. Okay, there we go. Gmail is being ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, uh, now while I'm doing open heart surgery on this uh, stream so that I can put the p correct picture on, let's go ahead and get started. All right, get a different thumbnail. So uh, upon reading this book, Gadsad starts by um, changing, or, or he, he starts by explaining to us what the sort of, uh, what sort of the his background is as a person, like his personal background, you know, who he is, um, who, who, his, his personal background and why he says and does the things that he does. You know, he tells us about his research and what motivates his research. Um, you know, it, you know, he sort of his personal motives for, um, doing, doing what he does. Anyway, uh, so he starts off talking about his childhood in Lebanon. He grew up in Lebanon, and apparently, uh, in addition to growing up there, experienced the Lebanese Civil War, and his family was Jewish. 
So uh, we know what generally happens in Middle Eastern countries besides Israel. When there's any kind of conflict or upheaval, what generally happens to the local Jewish population? So they left. Um, and he fled and went to Canada, to Montreal. Now, what I thought was kind of interesting, and I dis was discussing this prior to the stream with Alex, Gatsad is ordinarily exactly the kind of person whom you'd think the woke would listen to. Gadsad is exactly the sort of person who has been through who has been victimized, essentially, and so you'd think that they would listen to him or lend some credence to what he says, but it's not true. It doesn't work that way, and the reason that it doesn't work that way is that he doesn't agree with them politically, so they'll find some way to say he's oppressive. You know, I've seen people on Twitter saying things like, well, Gad said maybe a Middle Eastern Jew fleeing persecution, but he's uh, politically a white male. So it doesn't really even matter what he says, or who he is, rather. All that matters is whether he repeats the correct dogma. The, part of the benefit, well, quote-unquote, benefit of intersectionality is that I, if you say something I did disagree with, I can always find some place in the intersectional landscape where you're privileged and use that against you. You know, if you're not white, then I can say, oh, well, you're male, so you're privileged, so... Uh, you know, th this this is wrong and you're being oppressive. And if you're not white and not male, I can say, okay, well, you're straight. And if you're not white and not male and not straight, I can say, okay, well, you're cis. You know, no matter what you, no, no, no matter what class of people you belong to, intersectionality is fine-grained enough that I can always find something to fuck you over on. I can always find some way to say, oh, well, you're privileged, so you're wrong, which is really what intersectionality is meant to do. It's not about justice at all, really. It's not about justice in the least. What it's really about is creating political expediency for left-wing politics. That, that's really what it is. It's just about being expedient for leftist politics, and all of this stuff about minorities and oppression and so on are just a stalking horse for that. Now, um, so Gadsad introduces himself growing up in Lebanon, um, and he says his ideals are freedom and truth, which are incidentally the ideals of the West, or have been since the Enlightenment. Uh, freedom and truth being basically science and liberalism, which are the, you know, have been the tenets of Western society more and more for the past 500 years, um, since the Enlightenment. So freedom ideal, truth ideal... And he goes into talking about how universities are purveyors of truth, but also ecosystems of intellectual garbage. And now, Alex, I know that you had some time spent in academia in a professional capacity, so I would like to hear from you on this. Well, I was teaching in Kansas um, back in, uh, say, 2011? Uh, 20, 2011 to 2013. And... Um, it took a, a lot longer for uh, this shit to spread into the middle of the country. Uh, Kansas is pretty much the middle. Um, but it wasn't entirely absent during my time there. Um, there was a lot about hiring the right people already. Um, it's because I worked in the office, I got to hear kind of some of the stuff that was going on. Um, behind the scenes about like, oh, we need a new person for this position. And they, uh, they offered it to a black man, but he didn't take it because, um, Kansas is not the place most people want to end up teaching at. I mean, frankly, that's just true. If you, the more, if you get a more prestigious offer, you're going to go, you know, you get, you get an offer to a, a college in California, you're probably going to take it unless you're trying to avoid California. <laughs> So, um, so he didn't take it, and then their second choice was a gay man. And I'm not saying anything to the quality of these people's, um, acad you know, their scholarship or anything like that. In fact, when the, the man they ended up hiring was an incredibly intelligent uh, person. But the fact that it was a factor 
in how they considered their candidates shows a lot. Um, and frankly, it's, it's not something you should be paying attention to. Uh, at one point after that, there was a guest from New York um, that was specifically there for like a diversity, um, equality, inclusion, you know, one of the die people uh, to talk to them about um, hiring. And, oh, look at all the people in this room. They're all white, is essentially what she said. Um, forgoing the fact that, like, at least two of the people in that room were half Native American. Because, actually, it's really hard to tell in the Midwest who's uh, Native American. Like, because a lot of them just do look white, and they'll just say that's, you know, uh, close to your proximity to whiteness or whatever. But um, she really insulted everyone there because of that. And they actually pushed back on it to her face, um, which I appreciated. When I, when I heard that they did that, but that's not common. And in fact, it's getting worse. I looked at my alma mater uh, like a month ago and they changed their uh, women's studies program to their gender and women's studies program. And looking at courses they taught, looking at the people they hired um, and the fact that the woman who taught me my one women's studies course there was gone and she was actually intelligent and said that sometimes choice has a has an impact on uh, the outcomes. She said that <laughs> uh, she was gone, and I was like, "That's sh that's not a good sign." So um, I I imagine it's it's really uh, if it's taken over a Kansas college, it's it's taken over all colleges. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, 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 okay, so we have your report on that from your, from your time in Kansas, and basically that this has reached, this has reached a Kansas college, so it's everywhere, and it's, it was already there when you were there, and at this point, now that you've been out of it for a while, it's certainly colonized the whole thing. Um... I'd like to go into the next section here under uh, universities, purveyors of truth, ecosystems of intellectual garbage. And he, um, he says, I'm going to read some excerpts here. Beyond the incredibly rigorous training that I obtained at Cornell from many of the world's leading psychologists and economists, this is where I was also first exposed to some of the nonsensical gibberish that I critique in this book. I recall taking Professor Russo's doctoral seminar, during which he exposed us to the increasing number of postmodernist papers that were being published in the leading consumer research journals. One in particular exemplified this anti-science lunacy. In 1991, Stephen Jay Gould, not to be confused with the late Harvard paleontologist, there was a Stephen Jay Gould who was a paleontologist who, um, I think he was the bio- well, I thought he was a biologist. Maybe there's three of them, I don't know. The Stephen Jay Gould that I'm familiar with was a biologist- um, who said things like uh, evolution occurs at the speed of revolution, and he had a lot to say about things like genetics and um, and taxonomy and so on. He also came up with non-overlapping magisteria for the relation between religion and science. He had a few things to say. Anyway, authored a paper in which one in one of the most prestigious journals of the field of consumer research. The paper was titled, The Self-Manipulation of My Pervasive Perceived Vital Energy Through Product Use, An Introspective Praxis Perspective. Um, he then proceeded in an outlandish exercise of the postmodern methodology of autoethnography, a fancy way of saying he wrote a Dear Diary entry couched in pseudo-intellectual drivel. Here are two passages wherein he shares an academic take <clears throat> on his erection and orgasm. Yeah, and this guy basically just talks about jacking off for two paragraphs, and that's what he's doing. It's kind of meta. 
he's jacking off by talking about jacking off. The whole thing is one big meta masturbation session. Kind of sums up uh, most of the more Pomo work done in the humanities. And Gad said punctuates this by saying, Houston, we have a problem. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how uh, social constructivism is used as a lens through which everything can be viewed. Um, and how he sees that as blatantly anti-scientific, and he coins this term uh, biophobia, the fear of biology and explaining human, human phenomena. And one comment that I had on biophobia is that it, it, he is right that, that the woke are reticent to say anything about biology, but when they do, they always do it in a nonsensical way. For example, um, they're... Well, well, let's see here. For example, um, gender is a social construct, but being trans is completely rooted in individual biology. Isn't that, you know, just the strangest thing? It doesn't make any sense. There's no way to really talk about it. Um, th there's no way to reconcile those two things. Either it's an inherent thing in the brain or it's socially constructed. It is not... It, you can't have your cake and eat it. But the woke aren't really concerned with consistency. No, absolutely not. And um, this even confuses some actual trans people who are like, I can't be trans without the existence of biology. That doesn't make any sense. The whole transition is a reaction to biology. And honestly, like, that is so much smarter than anything these, you know, queer theorists or gender theorists come out with because it's like it's acknowledging reality at the very least. Um, and uh, the thing th that section made me laugh so hard, the part where he quotes from that paper, because I think he says something about like Asian techniques to delay gratification or something along those lines. And I'm like, are you talking about tan tantric sex? Just say that <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> Don't like bury it. Like, and, and that's a real problem with a lot of these things. Like the title of that paper is so like elitist with its language. Because they, they're trying to elevate what is essentially a, a diary entry, entry, a personal essay to be scholarship. And it's not. It's not scholarship. As you said, it's masturbatory. I can't say that word. <laughs> like, ever. It, it is completely masturbatory. It's, um, and that's one of the interesting things about postmodernism. It's actually a logical consequence of some of the stuff discussed in cynical theories. Remember, recall that the postmodern knowledge principle dictates that reality, if it exists, is unknowable, or at least not useful to talk about, and as a result, instead of ever discussing reality, all we can talk about are uh, human social interactions. More accurately, all we can really talk about is ourselves. It's all, the only responsible thing you can really do is talk about yourself because anything outside of that is unknowable. So on, we have that, and then we have the postmodern political principle which sees every bit of human interaction and all knowledge produced by institutions and knowledge production and so on to be the result of power relations, the result of the strategic situation in a given society, to use Foucault's definition of power. Um, so if the real world is unknowable and all you can really do is talk about yourself and everything comes down to power relations, then what it comes down to is an if your job as an individual <laughs> is to talk about yourself and nothing else in a way that asserts your, uh, in a way that asserts your, every, that you can use to assert yourself against all the institutions that are putatively oppressing you. So basically... Your job is to throw a tantrum and go, me, me, me. And that's the only responsible thing to do. It's an extremely infantile uh, way of looking at the world. But it's it's currently influential. 
Um, and I have kind of this half-baked theory that what has happened is as technology has made us more comfortable, as technology has made us softer, we've become more infantilized and childlike. And one of the results of that has been that things like this are now acceptable for adults to do. Um, I, I kind of got off on a tangent there about cynical theories, but uh, Alex, I mean, what do you have anything else to say about this, uh, this, these, uh, th this auto ethnography of jacking off on paper? Uh, I'd say it's narcissistic, for one thing. Um, listen, I have no problem about people talking about sex. Like, I feel like conversations about sex should happen. Uh, studies about sex and biology and the related to sex should happen. But this is not a study, and this is not someone talking about, talking to another person, having a dialogue about their sexual experience. This is someone who thinks his sexual experience is so freaking important that we all need to read about it and study it. And that's just not true! No one needs to read that. He's just a narcissist. <laughs> Well, not only that his sexual experience is important, maybe it is, maybe that's data, but more of his own monologue about his monologue about his experience. <laughs> like, it's so entrenched in this guy's interiority that its intelligibility is dubious. Can anyone else even understand what he really means by this? And if not, then what is he doing besides mumbling and jerking off with shit? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it, it, it's obnoxious. Um, anyway. Anyway, so he goes into idea pathogens of the human mind. Oh, well, no, one, one last thing. He says, According to them, that is, his colleagues in the social sciences... Biologically based theorizing was too reductionistic in explaining consumer behavior, and to postulate that sex differences might be rooted in evolutionary realities was simply sexist nonsense. I quickly learned that most academic feminists were profoundly hostile to evolutionary psychology. I was respected among evolutionary behavioral scientists and was derided by many marketing scholars. This biophobia, fear of biology and explaining human phenomena, has been a recurring form of science denialism that I've experienced throughout my academic career. Okay, now, there, there's one thing I wanted to say about this. I personally am somewhat skeptical of evolutionary bi uh, psychology, not because of the evolutionary part, but because of the psychology part. Um, I, I have a very, very deep skepticism of the social sciences and some philosophical reasons for being that way, and that could fill its own video. Um, in brief, I think that the more social it becomes, the less scientific it becomes, and the more scientific it becomes, the less social it becomes. I'm not saying that you can't do evolutionary psychology, I'm just saying that the more it is a social science, the less it is a science. Um, and then he goes on to critique the university and in saying that the herd mindset is rewarded, innovative thinkers are chastised, stay in your lane academics are rewarded, outspoken academics are published, or punished rather, hyper-specialization is rewarded, broad synthetic thinking is scorned, Every quality that should define intellectual courage is viewed as a problem. Anything that adheres to leftist tenets of progressivism is rewarded. Um, what is your thought on that? I know that your stint in the university system was some time ago, but do you have anything to say in response to his observations there? Um, he's right. I... Um... I knew one Republican professor at that university. Great guy. Uh, he had pictures of Republican presidents framed in his office. Um, and he was very, very honest and proud of the fact that he was a Republican. But um, honestly, they, mo the majority of them were liberal, were Democrats. And some of them were actually illiberal Democrats. 
um, sometimes talking to them, like, would get frustrating, like, even back then, um, even though we were in Kansas, sometimes the, the logic was not there. Um, and that was incredibly frustrating. Uh, and seeing some of the research, like, I had to read a lot of research papers, obviously. I was in grad school. Um, but, uh, and some of them were just so stupid. Uh, I was encouraged, though, to push that. Um, I was lucky enough that I had some professors that were, you know, very supportive of the idea that I had to have my own ideas. On the creative writing side, that wasn't so true, <laughs> sadly. Um, uh, they kind of, because the creative writing world has been woke longer than, um, uh, like, any other, like, I feel like the arts got taken first, if you're looking at academia. Like, right after the social sciences came the arts. So that, I, that was painful for me, uh, having to deal with that. But I, I think he's absolutely right. I do think that they've, uh, they reward, uh, Democrats and, and even illiberal Democrats. They don't care. Um, and that's the kind of research they want to see. To your point, though, about um, psychology, I do want to say this because I thought of it. Um, I think psychology is deeply flawed as a science because it does not look at the organ from which psychology stems. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, that's really stupid. If you were, you know, uh, studying the kidney, why would, would you not look at the kidney? Like, that's my thought on that. Um, if they start looking at the brain, I think they could completely. Uh, be scientific, but they're not right now. I mean, well, when you say the organ from which it stems, that would depend. Do we mean modern psychology or Freud? Because those would be two different organs. Um, <laughs> I mean, mostly the brain, but um, the your you are your body, and your body is you. So, to some extent, you know, um, organs interact. You can't pretend that that's not true. Uh, you know, if your brain's not getting enough oxygen from your lungs, if your heart's not pumping enough blood, there's, there's a lot of things going on there, like your hormone levels from your various glands. I'm not going to pretend like that is not true, but the fact that they won't even look at the brain, like, <laughs> they won't eat, they won't look at any organs for psychology, and I think that's the, that's the problem. Right. Now, it, it, it's kind of interesting, it's funny you should say that, because neuropsych is a thing, and there are parts of psychology that I think are more scientific. For example, in cognitive psychology, we can do this experiment where I point, I have you look at a dot, and I flash little lights around the dot, and depending on, um, depending on where those are situated, you may or may not be able to see color, and we can use that to verify that humans cannot see color outside of the fovea of their visual field. Okay, cool, that's science. Um, and there is stuff in neuropsych that goes on, but owing partially to our extremely primitive understanding of the brain, and partially to uh, the biophobia, I was about to use some clumsy phrase, but then I realized Gad defined it here, or put a label on it, Thanks to the biophobia of many of the flakier sections of psychology, a lot of that research just doesn't get done. Or if it does, it gets done in a way that's separated from the brain and separated from any and all material concerns and made totally useless. Um, so, so, so Gad goes on to list a bunch of different parasites, and he enumerates this list of parasites for a reason. The imagery here, and sort of the space of possibilities it carves out, and what it makes seem to be plausible is important. It has a very strong rhetorical purpose. Um, the animal kingdom is replete with examples of biological pathogens, that is, parasites, that once they infect an organism's brain yields some rather macabre outcomes, including a host's reproductive death, parasitic castration, if not actual death, hosts commit suicide in the service of the parasite. Take, for example, the spider wasp, 
which engages in a truly morbid behavior. It stings a much larger spider, rendering it in a zombie-like state, at which point the wasp drags it to a burrow and lays its eggs on it. The offspring eventually devour the hapless spider in vivo. Paralophostrongulus? Let me say that again. Paralophostrongulus tenuis is a parasite that infects the brains of ungulates, moose, deer, elk, causing afflicted animals to, at times, engage in circling behavior, going around in a small circle endlessly. This robotic behavior will continue even as looming predators approach the ill-fated animal. A third example of a brain parasite is Toxoplasma gondii, which, when it infects a mouse's brain, causes it to lose its otherwise adaptive fear of cats. Finally, Nematomorpha, Nematomorpha Latin, that should be worm shape or worm form, constitutes a class of suicide-inducing parasites that afflict a broad range of insects, including crickets, cockroaches, and praying mantises. For example, the Gordian worm gets its host, Cricket, to jump into a body of water which it would usually avo avoid so that the parasite can leave its host's body and look for a mate. In the same way that brain parasites have evolved to take advantage of their hosts in the furtherance of their evolutionary objectives, parasitic viruses of the human mind, devastatingly bad ideas, function in a similar manner. They parasitize human minds, rendering them impervious to critical thinking, while finding clever ways to spread across a given population. For example, getting students to enroll in women's studies departments. Uh, yeah. So, what, what I think is really interesting, and I want to stop here to uh, praise Gadsad's rhetorical abilities, because what is he doing there? He's enumerating all of these various parasites and showing what frighteningly complex behaviors they can induce in their hosts. So if simple biological parasites can drive an animal to do all these very sophisticated things in order to propagate themselves, in order for the parasites to propagate themselves, then how much more can how much more can parasitic ideas make people do things how much uh, more sophisticated any behaviors among humans and even systems of humans and even uh even um entire societies how how what kinds of patterns can emerge based on parasitic ideas. Well, and this is why some people are saying that it should actually be banned um, in academia, in public schools. Um, and some people are saying, oh, no, 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 that's illiberal. Uh, I don't know about that um, because of the fact that we have a civil rights act in the U.S. that basically is counter to everything this teaches. So that would actually say, and it's also possibly a violation of Title IX by creating a hostile uh, learning environment specifically to men. Um, so to me, I'm sort of like, maybe it should be banned because it is, it is really fast. It's like a forest fire, um, how this thing spreads um, and how it moves and it's dangerous uh, and it gets people killed. Like, that's the thing, like, like, he, like, viruses and parasites kill, like, eventually. Um, and people, are, people commit suicide over this. Once cancel culture comes to them, some people have committed suicide. Um, and some people uh, violently assault someone else, even unto death. So to me, I'm sort of like, um, yeah, ban it, because it's dangerous. We don't invite the parasite into our body. You know, we we find a way to fight it. And, I mean, isn't that why everybody's wearing masks? <laughs> and this is a parasitic idea, so we should be fighting it. 
It's just my thought. Yes, and I, I would like to add to that. On the idea of banning this in schools, we can say that that's illiberal, but it's really not, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, Gad compares this, I think, very, uh, very aptly to creationism. Should cre if creationism is not real biology, it should not be taught in a biology class, and this stuff is very similar. Second of all, there is a big difference between government primary and secondary schools uh, private primary and secondary schools and universities. If a someone wants to open a private school, kind of like a Catholic school, but for wokeism, by all means do it, and the woke people can send their kids there. Uh, making this stuff compulsory in government schools is completely unconscionable. Uh, forcing children to go through this stuff when they're being legally compelled to attend school is uh, is reprehensible. So th th this idea that banning it is illiberal is nonsense. Um, it should only be allowed in universities, if anywhere. And if it is allowed in the university, then th then it should be uh, it should not be required. So that's two giant steps back, and I would take it a step further and say that if it is, if it isn't required, we also need strong safeguards in place to keep it from becoming optional. As in, technically, you don't have to participate in this stuff, but unless you want to have your professor fail you or whatever, you'd better do it. We have to keep that from happening, too. So we need a very, very strong backlash here to push this stuff back into uh, the disgusting little Pandora's box it emerged from. And I think that that is very likely to happen. Um, the, uh, the, the, the backlash, the, the last time we had a backlash against this stuff was 2016, and that was electing Donald Trump and many people on the left, not liberals so much, but leftists thought that that was the end of the world. You think that was bad? You should see the ba backlash that is coming for June of 2020. Good grief. Um, and I'm not talking about violence. I hope it's not violent, but um, things could get politically very, very unpalatable for those on the left. Uh, moving on. He, he has this term, ostrich parasitic syndrome. Would you like to tell us your understanding of that, Alex? Uh, yes, my understanding is that it is a method by which you ignore uh, things you don't like because they are um, damaging to your worldview. Um, and specifically in, you know, uh, the critical social justice ideology idea, it's about protecting yourself from data because most data is going to be counter to its worldview. Does that make sense to what he wrote? <laughs> yes, yes. And I would go as far as to say that... Well, he, he has an example a little ways back that I, that, that I really resonated with because I've had similar encounters with people. A family member remarked to me that the ancient Greeks were anti-Semitic Christians, to which I gently retorted that they were not Christians. The individual in question insisted that, of course, they were Christians. At that point, I explained that the time period in question was labeled B.C. in reference to its being before Christ, prior to Christianity. Once it was clear that this, to this person that my position was unassailable, what do you think he did? Did he grant me the courtesy of admitting that he was wrong? I have recounted this tale on a few occasions and asked people to guess what his reaction was. No one has successfully cracked that mystery yet. When all hope that he might be proven correct was extinguished, he looked me in the eyes and stated with a straight face, Yes, I said that they were not Christians, and you said that they were, so I am right. Of course, we both knew that this was a grotesque lie, but in his narcissistic and delusional bubble, his perfect record of superior knowledge remained intact. 
And this is something that I have dealt with many times in my life, particularly I used to, operative phrase here, used to, have friends who were progressives, who were involved in uh, die ideology, diversity, inclusion, equity. Um, and his... And these people that I was friends with for a while, eventually, when I spoke to them, it wasn't any longer a matter of disagreement. They were just straight up detached from reality. In exactly the manner that uh, Gadsad's family member was. Um, this is... And, and I can give you an example of this. I can give you an example of this. I have a friend, or had a friend, um, who got into an... Who, who I got... Well, let me think. Do you have any examples of this that you've had with woke people online or in person? Um, yeah, um... One of the biggest ones is the one that you got involved in eventually, where the person kept saying I hated everything that wasn't white, male, cis, straight, like and anything like that. And it's like, well, I'm a woman, so no. Um, and uh, that all those things disgusted me was the, the accusation. And of course, I replied... Um, at one point, I said something about how uh, Idris Elba is an incredibly attractive man. And then they moved on to the idea that um, I was fetishizing a black man. Like, um, so there was no way for me to win. Ever. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the... I know, like, that's as close as I can think of an, of an example. Um... But for the most part, I'd say people build straw man. So that's a, to some extent, that's what's going on in a lot of these arguments, is someone built a straw man of your own argument. They, they, they decided to fight against a different point than what you were making. Um, and that can be incredibly frustrating, which, at, at which point you almost have to just restate your argument. Um, uh, but, like... Someone literally turning around and doing the um, duck season, rabbit season, and trick on me. That hasn't happened. I have not, and that's not happened to me personally. So I don't know if that's happened to you, but that's my best metaphor for it is from Looney Tunes. All right. Uh, you did break up there a little bit, but I think the stream can probably still hear you. Uh, I think that was my connection. It was on my end. But anyway, the duck season, rabbit season thing, yeah, for me, that has not happened. But I have gotten some straw men. And the straw, but the straw men are so ridiculous that it's obvious that this person is not interested in engaging with reality. Um, they're interested in coming up with a rationalization for ignoring any reality that they don't like. One example of this is when I opined that it was the rural, primarily, or, or predominantly white, but overall the entire rural working class that got Trump elected. And the person I was arguing with said, well, mathematically I can see what you're talking about, but shouldn't we be focusing on XYZ social justice issue? It's almost as if the real reason for the failure of left-wing parties, political parties, is something that cannot be remedied, that they can't remedy, because it's something that left-wing political po thought simply refuses to acknowledge. Um, another, another example of this was when I said that When I, criti I criticized feminists once, I criticized the feminist movement and said I thought that they used Mott and Bailey doctrines. And the response was, oh, so you think all women use Mott and Bailey arguments? And I said, I said feminists, not women. And the response was, you're splitting hairs. Now, that's not hair splitting, that's just them straight up not listening. 
straight up ignoring me and then making up some alternate reality. It's just straight up delusional. But notice what happens is if you back one of these people into a corner, the response that you will get is essentially... It's essentially that thing from Mythbusters, you know, I reject your reality and substitute my own. Uh, that's what you're going to get. Because any... And one thing that you'll hear from them repeatedly over and over, and this is this is another case of ostrich parasitic syndrome. This is great. Gadsad is a, is a professor of marketing, I just want to say, and that's why I thought, okay, whatever memes he comes up with, I'm going to do my best to spread them. This guy's a marketing professor, so he probably knows how to, how to wrap ideas up in easily digestible pieces so that they'll spread. It's what he's good at. Um, and ostrich parasitic syndrome is a good way to is a good thing to call this. It is ostrich parasitic syndrome because what you'll notice with these people is you'll hear these phrases over and over again like, I don't see why it's so interesting, or I don't see why it matters, or I don't see why that's relevant, where it very obviously does matter and is interesting and is relevant because it's real. Um, but they'll ignore it, and it's ostrich parasitic syndrome. And one of the things that that these these critical theories do is they provide a theoretical framework that allows you to efface or obscure anything that is not convenient for you ideologically. Um, and because they allow you to do that, it, it, it creates this situation where ostrich parasitic syndrome is enabled. Because if you have a framework that lets you obscure anything you don't like, and that inculcates you with a particular ideology, then you, you your natural response to anything that contradicts your ideology is going to be is going to be to ignore it, and that's ostrich parasitic syndrome. Um, there are a number of theoretical tools provided by critical theories that allow people to do this. Um, for example the postmodern knowledge principle that every that all forms of knowledge production are the result of institutional power that principle is that principle allows you to say things like well it doesn't matter what these evolutionary psychologists say that it's just produced the, the the knowledge production of this institution is a result of institutionalized sexism so even if a woman is doing it it doesn't matter or even if a trans person is doing it it doesn't matter um they can always say well institutionally this is the result of blah 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 power relation therefore this is irrelevant so no matter what data you expose them to they can always just ignore it and that's one mechanism by which ostrich parasitic syndrome works i okay so i did see someone bury their head in the sand recently this past week um i talked to a lot of people who fight for men's rights on a regular basis um and someone some feminist was going on about how, well, oh, women have it so much harder, even in Western society, like, oh, so, so more likely to be killed, or, and that's just not true. Um, and so someone replied with 59 tweets of data, like links and uh, charts, and it was all, like, really amazing, like, research that this guy did. And she said, I'm not reading all that stupid, boring stuff, was her response. And I was, my reply to her was, uh, data on gender inequality is not stupid, boring stuff when you claim to fight against it. It's the information you need to know where to start. So to me, that, that was definitely ostrich uh, parasitic syndrome, because she literally refused to read it. Riffing off of that, I saw another example of this that is hilarious because it's almost as it almost comes across like a joke, as if they're trying to lampshade their willful ignorance. But but then when you, but then you realize that they're serious, and you get this horrible sinking feeling when you see how detached from reality they are. Um, I witnessed someone arguing that homelessness 
was a case uh, was a case or caused by institutionalized sexism and that it came from a disdain for women and when i was asked or when i asked why that was this person responded well one in four homeless people is a woman i didn't have the heart to say well three out of four of them are men so but well it wouldn't matter if more homeless people are men, they'll say, oh, well, that's because of patriarchy, or that's because of systemic blah, 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 therefore I'm still right. What in they, th This ideology is set up so that it can ignore any data it wants, or re anything you say, they'll just reinterpret it to make it into evidence for their own view. It, it, it's, it, 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 it's psychosis. It's a complete absence of any tether to reality. It's an institutionalized psychosis. Um, so, let, let's go a little further. He says, in his 1976 classic, The Selfish Gene, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins famously introduced the concept of the meme to our public consciousness. Memes are packets of information that spread from one brain to another. In reading this book, your brain is infected by my memes. If you then discuss this idea with your social circle, my memes are further propagated. And of course, if we get on YouTube and discuss it, then we're sort of just spraying them everywhere, and other people can come and watch this afterward, and and this becomes sort of a, a node in the network that is distributing these things. Unless my social media is being throttled, which I strongly suspect it is. Um... I have been at 1,880 subscribers exactly for a long time now, and I'm really wondering if I'm being throttled. So if anybody, Alex, you already do this regularly, but if anybody watching can share my channel around their social media, that would help. Um, so anyway, from this perspective, OPS... Ostrich parasitic syndrome, is a mimetic disease of the human mind. When facing a pathogenic epidemic, we call on modern-day dragon slayers, namely infectious disease specialists and epidemiologists, to intervene. They defend us against a broad range of monstrous pathogens dead set on infecting us. Part of their job description is to understand where a pathogen originates, the manner and speed by which it spreads, the identity of the first person to be infected, patient zero, uh, in this case I think Foucault is pretty clearly patient zero. Uh, Deprogrammer says, how do you tether yourself to reality? Um, I would say by paying attention to it, it's really not that hard. Um, I can choose to ignore the traffic on the freeway and run across, or I can maintain my tethered reality by paying attention to the fact that there's traffic there. Uh, anyway, this is precisely the approach that must be taken in defeating parasitic viruses of the human mind. Um, and he identifies eight areas, radical feminism, postmodernism, social constructivism, political correctness, identity politics coupled with progressive self-flagellation, culture of perpetual offense and victimhood, echo chambers void of intellectual diversity, and cultural and moral relativism. And th those are what he identifies as the roots of the death of the West, so to speak. Do you have any thoughts on that, Alex? Okay, so you brought up echo chambers. Uh, someone asked me recently, uh, how do you tell the difference between an echo chamber and a think tank? Um, because how do you know that this group of people is willing to, uh, is recognizing reality and working to change it, as opposed to believing in a meta narrative? And I said that to me, the best way to know is um, how do they react to new data? Do they reject it outright, or do they take it in and assimilate it into the data they already have? Uh, how do they react um, to their known unknowns, and how do they react to their unknown unknowns? Uh, because an echo chamber is not going to take in new data. It is going to reject it. Uh, they are going to act as if there are no unknowns at all. And I think that's kind of, uh, because recognizing, like, people throw the phrase around echo chamber, um, and 
and we don't really often define it or uh, teach people how to recognize it. That's my thought on how to recognize it, but um, uh, it, it is something that you need to make sure that when you go into a group or an organization that you pay attention about whether or not it is an echo chamber because whether or not you go into something with an open mind, um, an organization and a group of people can force you to close your mind. Enough voices telling you uh, something is eventually they're going to convince you. So you need to go in there and examine first whether or not they are an echo chamber. Um, so, and that is a good way of preventing yourself of from having a parasitic idea take over. Precisely. Um, so I think that uh, ostrich parasitic syndrome, OPS, is a term that we should probably all start using um, because it's a great way to describe a lot of these behaviors. You know, whenever someone responds with, well, I don't see why it's so interesting, or I don't see why it matters, or I don't see the relevance of this, all these terms that the woke use to ignore any data that they don't like, we can sort of uh, forestall that by using the term OPS. Once that term becomes popular enough and people know what it means, it, it, it will begin to counteract that. This is an inoculation, and this is Gad Sads uh, using his intersecting expertise as both someone who has studied biology and someone who understands marketing to create an inoculation against this particular kind of behavior. Um, so, so yeah, so that's definitely helpful. Uh, this, I think, is a good place to end the stream. My closing statement is that I would like for everyone here, if this is your first time here or one of your first few times, click the subscribe button, click the little bell so you always get alerted when you, uh, when you, when we stream. And on top of all of that, please make sure to click the like button. Alex, do you have a closing statement? Um, just that um, Gad said goes over his personal I, like outlook on life, and I felt like a, a close affinity to how he looked at the world. Um, because I always had the I have two central tenets that I live by, which I came up with those like 10 years ago, so it's before he <laughs> mentioned before I read that he has two, and m one of mine is you can always be assured of the knowledge that you will one day be wrong. Uh, which is about being humble about what you know and don't know. Um, so I felt, I felt a close affinity to him and how he looked at the world based on this chapter. Um, and in response to that, uh, one moment. Um, in response to that, or as a closing statement, I, I already made one, I'll say one more thing. Look at the, uh, description where you can follow me on Substack if you want to read my writing. Uh, thank you all for showing up, and uh, thank you, Deprogrammer, for showing up. You said that you're a long-time subscriber. Well, thank you for being here. Um, thank you, everyone, for showing up. You all make me feel warm and fuzzy inside when you show up to one of these. That's all I have for now.